Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino, and this is Dingo Talk. Uh, a few months ago, before we started with the coaches and the commissioner of the OAC, uh, we interviewed the interim president from Bethany College. Uh, I sat down with Dr. Jamie Caridi and had a, a really good conversation talking about where, the, where he sees the college going, um, what the search for the new president looks like, among also how he made his journey. Uh, before you get into that episode, though, I want to say thank you. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like button and subscribe. Don't miss anything from Dingo Talk. If you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you get your podcast, hit that little bell notification. And give us a thumbs up on the show if you enjoy. Um, you can follow us on the social media pages, which are Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. The only one different is Dingo underscore talk for the Instagram page. Um, but like I said, we're going to sit here, and this this hits home for a lot of the people. Hi to my Bethany people from the alumni tour and the coaches show and everything else when, when we were uh, still living in Bethany. Uh, but this is kind of a welcome back, get a little conversation with the interim president, and uh, find out what the plan is for the future of the college. Um, but not my story to tell, it's his story to tell. So without further ado, this is Dr. Jamie Carini. What's going on, Chuckleheads? As I said in the intro, we are joined this week by Interim Bethany College President, J Dr. Jamie Caridi. Dr. Caridi, thank you for sitting down with us. No, it's my pleasure, Carlo. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm going to do what I do to everybody. I'm going to take you back in the past, and we're going to work our way to, to today. Um, so I have to gather, you're, you, you, you went to St. Vincent College, uh, Western Pennsylvania kid. I am. I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's uh, that's where I herald from. And as you know, you can take a Pittsburgh out of Pittsburgh or Pittsburgh, but you really can't, right? It's no. uh, it never leaves you. It's my hometown. It's my heart and soul, and, and uh, lots of family still there, and uh, love it dearly. So, grew, grew up not far from the foothills of Bethany, West Virginia. Now, why St. Vincent? 1992 yeah, why was your why were we going into uh out to Latrobe I should say yeah you know I knew I wanted to stay somewhat local I happened to be a a guy that actually liked their family and uh and still likes their family so you know the idea of being real far away it was not appealing I wanted to be far enough that mom and dad had to call before they showed up like most uh, college co-eds uh, feel and uh, my faith tradition is Catholic, so St. Vincent made the list uh, for that reason, as well as it had a very strong and still does natural sciences program. So uh, at that point in my life, I thought I would be heading to med school. I actually did spend a little time in med school, but, um, but had a wonderful education there. It's a phenomenal small private Catholic college. The president is uh, a friend of mine. I actually used to work for that president when I was at St. Vincent for a while. So uh, it's got a special place in my heart, especially since I met my wife there. And um, I have a big family, lots of kids. And if it weren't for meeting my wife, they wouldn't exist. So I, I owe a lot to my alma mater. I had a great small private uh, college experience. Now, for those that don't know, take us into what it's like to be a student at St. Vincent, because very similar to Bethany in, the, in small class sizes and whatnot, uh, but world's different in the fact that you can come off a campus and you're 10 minutes away from something as opposed to the six mile stretch that nobody likes to drive down 66. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the early 90s were a little different than today. So you're right. It probably wasn't dissimilar to when students today are dropped off on Main Street and at Campbell's Village in, in Bethany. I, um, you know, St. Vincent is and, and was a place where you have to make your community. You have to throw yourself into opportunity. You have to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where you uh, can't expect it to be entertained all the time. You have to, um, you know, dive in the deep end and, and make your own experience what you want it to be. And and there is a lot of similarities between that and Bethany. And that's a good thing because mm -hmm. I think that's one of the special secret sauces of small private institutions that, 
you know, large institutions can't always do or replicate. There's an intimacy to attending a small private college. And I'm sure that was your experience when you attended Bethany. I know when I talked to students today, uh, just earlier today, I had a student in my office and she absolutely loves Bethany College. And when I asked her why, she didn't, she didn't use the word, the intimacy of the relationships there, but that's what, in, in many respects, that's what she was saying. And mm -hmm. that that's, that's hard to replicate. So that was part of my experience. And uh, that's why I grow passion for small private faith-based institutions. And that's why I love serving as president of Bethany College at this time. Well, so you, you touched on the fact that you, you dabbled in, in medical school, um, coming out with a biology degree from St. Vincent. Um, mm -hmm. What called you back? And I like I, I don't, I don't normally use that phrase, but I heard you use it in a different interview. So I kind of wanted to pull that. Um, what called you back to higher education? Why get back? Why jump back in and not continue down the road of, I mean, you, you become a doctor, just a different type of doctor. Yeah. yeah I'm the doctor on a plane that can't help you if you're having a <laughs> um, Look, uh, discerning what your vocation calling uh, is in life is a process. And um, it's interesting. We expect 16 and 17 year olds when they're sophomores, juniors, seniors in high school to figure out what they want to do with the rest of their life. And the truth is, I find the most honest student is often the student that shows up and majors as an undecided for their first year in college. Because the truth is, two thirds of students actually change their major mm -hmm. in college. And um, that's just another indicator that it takes a pro it takes a while to really understand, you know, who you want want to be and what you want to do. And that was the case for me. I, I loved my time at St. Vincent. I loved my time being a natural science biology major. Um, I didn't love the fact that on Friday afternoons when all my friends were getting ready for the Friday night festivities, I was in a lab with you know, lab rats or an autoclave or a, a, a project that needed to get done, a lab report. But nonetheless, <laughs> it served me well. Not that I'm bitter about that, but it served me well. I learned a lot about my own capabilities and then went off to medical school and um, did really well, but um, did not feel like that's where I was ultimately being called to be. And at the time, there was an opportunity back at my alma mater to uh, return in an administrative capacity. And um, I found that very intriguing. I was always a very involved student, much like I'm sure you were, Carlo, at Bethany. And nobody ever grows up saying, I want to be in higher education. That's just not what kids dream about, right? But then you learn this whole world exists. And it's a special place. And you can really, um, you can transform lives, but you can also have your own life transformed by it. So that's what drew me back to St. Vincent in an administrative capacity. And I got the higher ed bug and hasn't stopped ever since. So you get back to St. Vincent in 98. And then for a little bit, you're, you're there as the assistant VP and uh, Dean of Students, when do you decide that you're gonna jump back in to your education for your master's? Yeah, pretty quickly, uh, frankly. I, I went back, my first job in higher education was as a director of student activities. Mm -hmm. um, but then anyone that works in higher education, particularly at a small private school, you know there's an other duties as assigned a bullet on your position description. So I was like this jack of all trades. Uh, I had to do everything from setting up the AV for any, you know, tech event, you, mm -hmm. you name it. And then, um, you know, after being in the space and in the field for about six months, recognize that it truly is a, a profession. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn about adolescent development, student development. There's a lot of developmental theory um, and so, you know, I knew that I was lacking that. So that's when I began to pursue a master's in higher education at Geneva College. And, um, and it served me well. There's, uh, there's something to being a student of a field that you are working in. You take it very seriously and you enjoy it a whole lot more. So I uh, now I may have had to do something with the fact that I was paying for my own master's at that point. So I, I knew uh, if I skip this class, you know what this class is actually costing me? I didn't necessarily think that way as a 
18 year old freshman when I was, you know, happy mm -hmm. to maybe miss an English 101 class, but um, definitely have appreciation for it. Um, so we're going to throw you a little curveball here. What if you could have, uh, let's say, a luncheon with three people, who would they be and why? Oh my gosh. Uh, living or your call. It can be anybody through history. It can be anybody in, in the field. It can be somebody that you particularly would just like to sit down and have a lunch with. Well, I would be insane as a uh, person who uh, tries to live a life of faith to say, uh, Jesus Christ would be on that list. <laughs> if, if he'll have me for lunch. Yeah. 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 Understandable. Um, so I certainly uh, owe every blessing I have to him and uh, and have a lot of questions for him as well. So uh, the second person I would probably put on that list is uh, Father Ted Hesburgh, who was the president of Notre Dame for, oh my gosh, for four decades, I believe. Um, incredible uh, leader, uh, happens to be in the space of higher education, but he's just an incredible leader. He's a civil rights leader. He was an academic leader. Mm -hmm. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He was a Catholic leader, uh, a Christian leader. So he he checked a lot of the boxes of um, uh, you know, from a leadership perspective that uh, I admire and can continue to uh, learn from. So that would certainly be of interest to me. I actually met him he came back and was the commencement speaker one year at St. Vincent College. I didn't have the opportunity to spend much time with him, though. And I really, at that time, did not fully appreciate uh, his body of work mm -hmm. and, and all the contributions he made to American higher education. Um, I mean, the, the third uh, person or people, I would say, would have to be my, my parents. They, they have, they're both deceased. And um, my dad's been gone. Uh, my mom passed just a few years ago. My dad, in particular... Uh, he passed when I just had turned 20 at the young age of 55. So um, I've now lived more of my life without my dad uh, than with him. And um, we I've come to learn we were very much alike. And so I would have uh, would take that lunch to thank him, express my gratitude for his fatherhood, um, but to um, also just to have one more opportunity. So that's my list. That's a that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty interesting luncheon that's going to happen there because you're going to have <laughs> Jesus, you're going to have a father, and you're going to have your father there all together, and what a conversation that could be. Um, so jumping back into your story, so you get your master's in two thousand and two, um, and then from your resume, it looks like you jumped immediately into pursuing your PhD. Now, why choose why Nebraska? Why is that where you chose to get your PhD through? Yeah, great question, Carlo. At the time, I had already had four children, and I really wanted to go to the number one um, higher education PhD program in the country. And the two schools that consistently battle for number one slot in U.S. News is Michigan and Penn State. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got into Penn State, and I was thrilled because not a lot of people do. No. And I was attempting to do the uh, drive up to state college once a week. And I quickly learned that once that commenced, this program was really designed for somebody that, uh, frankly, uh, doesn't have all the commitments I have, full-time job, four children, a spouse, living two hours away. So it became pretty apparent to me that um, you know, there's a difference between the best program in the country and the best program for me. Mm -hmm. And at that point in my life, um, I needed a little bit more flexibility. And so Nebraska has had a strong program for a very long time. They were one of the first ones ever in the space of this thing called distance learning. In fact, Nebraska in the 1970s and 80s actually ran a correspondence school where they would send you all your materials at home to be a student and you'd send your information back. So they, you talk about distance learning, they were one of the first schools in and back in the um, early 2000s, you know, that was a time when online learning was still very speculative. Uh, speculative. A lot of people poo-pooed it and thought, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't going to last. This isn't going to be around. And I had the good fortune at that time to speak with a few um, prominent leaders in higher education. And I asked them about 
um, Nebraska's program, which was both a blend of on ground and online. And they said, online is the thing of the future. Within 10 years, every school in the country will be doing it or will wish they had already jumped in. And um, and sure enough, here we are in 2023. And they, in fact, were right. So I had a wonderful experience, University of Nebraska. Um, it's a major university like mm -hmm. WVU or Penn State or Ohio State. Um, I certainly had to go out there on several occasions to, to do my work, but most of it was able to be done uh, via distance, which served my life very well. Now, do you see, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead now that you're, we're, we're getting closer to um, your, your consultant firm and um, Bethany College, but do you see online education going further? Is there ever going to, I guess, let me rephrase that. Is there ever going to come a time where a cert, a, a college's, that maybe struggle with in-person attendance, would they ever lean towards just being an online school? I know they have those directly, but you could you see as a way for a school to maybe weather a storm? Would that be somewhere where they kind of put it, put it forefront as opposed to it being an option? Or is that just, they're going to have to learn to coexist as they do now? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a big question you're asking. I think every institution that um, is evaluating their delivery modalities, which online is a way to do it, mm -hmm. hybrid is a way, on ground is a way to do it. Um, you first need to you know check your mission. You know, be mindful of your mission. Who is it we say we're going to be? What is it that experience looks like? And how is it that we inculcate that experience in whatever delivery modality we use? Um, it doesn't mean for small private schools that online is not an option for you. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. But there's an integrity to the experience that you want to make sure remains. Uh, that's what made, for example, places like Bethany so special. That's why when I speak with alum from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, they have such fond memories of it. It's because of the experience. So it, it's not that that experience can't happen in a different forum, but you have to be very thoughtful about it. And um, too often schools aren't. They think you can just flip a switch and, and continue to, to do that. And, and it ends up at times being a less than optimal education. And at times it can become very transactional. And, you know, we're in the business of being transformational at Bethany, not transactional. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you got to be focused on what transformation means and what that looks like in somebody's life. Um, that being said, you know, Bethany College absolutely is uh, looking at online. We, we will be having some online uh, courses. We already do have online courses, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, but you got to be very thoughtful about it. Well, and into your, the consultant firm, and I want to make sure I say that right, Terra Firma, correct? That's right. You've got your Latin down for the, the evening. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the big diploma behind me over there. It, <laughs> it helped with it. Um, there's a lot of words on there I haven't gotten to yet, but we'll get there. We're just, we're slow in our, we're, we're on a crawl at the time. Um, why create the consultant firm yeah. and who was it for? Yeah. So, um, just a, a little bit of background. I spent, when I went back to St. Vincent, I spent 10 years there as a higher ed professional, ultimately leaving as a vice president and dean. I then went to Ohio Dominican University in Columbus, where I spent uh, just over nine years as a vice president and dean. Um, I then actually spent some time with Ohio State University, and um, that was through a corporate role I had with IMG, which most people know as a a sports marketing entertainment company, and it is, but they actually have a higher education division. And I did all the corporate sponsorships for Ohio State, specifically athletics. Um, it was through those three experiences that I confirmed that indeed, you know, my vocation, my professional vocation certainly is higher ed, but my specific, um, my specific passion is for small private uh, faith-based higher education. So, when I left IMG, I decided to found Terra Firma, and uh, Terra Firma is a, a small boutique higher education uh, practice uh, that focuses on small private institutions and specifically helping their governing boards and their leadership teams 
with um, strategy and with um, institutional renewal, especially at a time when many schools are dealing with tremendous headwinds and, um, you know, in some cases distressed and need to move to a state of stability and ultimately viability and prosperity. So that that's, you know, kind of the passion behind why I founded Terra Firma. And then now we're we're here in, in present day and, and you've now been at Bethany for now it's three years altogether, but two years in the in the interim role, correct? So close. Uh we I've been with Bethany almost two years. So the first year was as a consultant. Mm -hmm. I helped Dr. Rodenberg and, and the board with some strategy and governance related matters. And um and then once Dr. Rodenberg had announced her retirement. That's when the board had asked me to if I'd be willing to serve as interim president, and uh, so that took effect January first of last year. Um, so let's talk about Bethany. As an alumni, I've had a, I've had a number of people, a, a number of alumni on, a number of board board of trustee members on. Um, let's start with the 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 root of it. There's a strategic plan. There's partnerships being made all over the place this year. You guys are very active trying to get um, alternate routes once you leave Bethany, how to further the education, further the um, opportunity that you're going to have. Um, what would you say the biggest issue currently at Bethany is and how what what is the path that that we're on? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot to say to that as far as the biggest issue at Bethany. I think, um, you know, there's lots of priorities at Bethany College now. So I don't know that I'll use the word issues, but I'll say priorities that we we have. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll articulate a few of them here for you. It won't necessarily be a completely exhaustive list, but you know, first and foremost, um, before I start talking about enrollment numbers, et cetera, we need to make sure that um, everything we do as an institution, our reason for being ultimately is the academic programs we provide, that we are delivering the highest quality programs of integrity, number one. Mm -hmm. So we start. Number two, uh, then those programs need to be responsive to the needs of the marketplace. Um, and the marketplace can be defined in very different ways, right? The marketplace is prospective families and students. It, it includes companies and corporations. It includes nonprofit entities. It improve, includes local government, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we need to be responsive to the needs of those various constituencies. And then, um, you know, and then we need to enroll, you know, students that are capable of achieving the expectations of our high quality programs of integrity. So, you know, that's uh, that's our charge. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot said there because number one, we're not gonna water down our curriculum or-, or Nor um, should you. Nor should you. Uh, number two, the risk can be, so you maintain that integrity, but if you start letting just anybody in uh, because you're chasing an enrollment number, uh, given the fact that enrollment matters, well, that also isn't good. It's it ultimately doesn't serve the institution well. It's an injustice, frankly, to the uh, to the student who uh, ultimately you know ends up uh, you know attrition mm -hmm. and you know at times saddled with debt, et cetera. So we need to make sure that that bridge between teaching and learning is uh, you know not a bridge that's too far to cross for our prospective students. And so um, so those are some of the priorities. Certainly we're at an era of academic entrepreneurship and innovation on campus. So, you know, there's a lot of research out there that will, will, you, know, you can pull up that will show that you know, most of what the fields that people are working in today didn't exist 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be part of that in innovation and entrepreneurship. That's why our faculty have created and approved six new programs in the last year. Um, that's a lot of yeah. innovation, entrepreneurship, and um, and that's going to continue. And um, you know, the other thing that's a priority right now is strategic partnerships with our community. Uh, we've been executing a number of those with other educational institutions, um, K through twelve, 
uh, other post-secondary institutions. And now we're talking, um, you know, we have robust conversations going on with various corporations as well on how we can serve their uh, the needs of their workforce. So, you know, this issue of lifelong learning is real. So yes, Bethany um, exists to serve the traditional undergraduate student, but, you know, we never stop learning. And so no. there's no reason why we can't serve the needs of non-traditional students, adult learners, et cetera, all of the above. Well, there's a couple of things to unpack there. Um, one, for those the for those Bethany people that, that have stayed with us through these hundred and some episodes, you'll be happy to hear that uh, the current enrollment is roughly about 600 students. The projected for next year is roughly about 700. So there's there's increase there. there there's wait lists for certain classes. There's uh, there's good conversation from a president standpoint. I would assume these are the kind of conversations you want to have. You. You know, where are we going to house these students? How are we going to get them into the classes they want? These are the things that get people more excited about um, almost like a hands-on, it's a hands-on effort. Uh, was that part of the five pillars to begin with? Because I remember when you had the town hall meeting and you introduced them, was that part of the strategic plan? And the did you expect to see it happen this quickly? It seems like we've kind of really amped up the gears. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Uh, I did expect that because that was our charge. And, um, you know, there was a lot of reasons to be motivated to get a lot of things done pretty quickly, frankly. And um, so it's not that it was unexpected. I am pleased with the progress that's been made. We're just over one year since the board approved the three-year strategic plan. There were five pillars of the plan. I'll remind everybody those five pillars include academics, which I've already spoken about. It includes uh, the infrastructure, the campus itself, making sure we're tending to the 33 buildings and the 1,100 acres we have. It includes the student experience. What does that look like? Whether it's where they live, what the co-curricular experience looks like, um, what their career development looks like. Uh, it includes uh, the resources of the campus, whether it be, you know, you mentioned enrollment. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the progress we're making. Uh, in 2021 fall, we had 530 students. Fall of 2022, we had 600. You're right. Our goal next year is 700. You know, fingers crossed, salt over the shoulder, and you know, three Hail Marys. Hopefully, we get there. But, um, you know, we've got the ingredients to bake that cake for next year. Whether or not we'll hit exactly 700, I can't tell you right now. But but we're growing, and we're starting to deal with the good kinds of problems. And you've already mentioned one: where we're going to house all these students. Well. A, a, any president will take that problem any day of the week. And um, and the last pillar was strategic partnerships. And so I've already discussed that. So each of those pillars we're working very uh, hard on. The board's very engaged. This is not my strategic plan. It's the board's strategic plan. Mm -hmm. I am uh, I'm just one of a workforce of 150 and a board of 30 plus and an alumni of you know 10,000. And it's it's on all of us, right? And, um, you know, I, I'm privileged to sit in this chair right now at this time to serve in this capacity. And I'm often the mouthpiece for what's going on. But this is a team effort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the successes we've had are because of the team. And frankly, we need more members of the team, you know, yet as we move into year two of the strategic plan where uh, I like to tell people we're in the silent phase of a fundraising campaign. Uh, it's the worst kept secret in the world because I need, I need it to be the worst kept secret because I want everybody to know I'm looking for them to onboard and invest in the college. But we're having a lot of success there as well. So um, it's really important because the college needs it at this time. Now, not specifically Bethany, but small liberal arts colleges have, have kind of been weathering a storm now for uh, at least the amount of time that I was at Bethany as a student, not at living in the town, um, probably as long as I was living in the town as well, is is the expense of a liberal arts college a, a deterrent when you talk to parents? Is that something that they kind of go like this? What is your, how do you get them around to, you know, it, it is expensive to go, and it's not just Bethany, every, most colleges, it's expensive. If it's not, if it's a private school specifically, you're paying for that education. Um, so what is some of the things that you and the admissions people are saying to these parents to, to get them on board to be a part of the new generation of bison that come through the door? 
Yeah, it's among the most serious uh, of, of questions that we get asked because you can see it in the parents' eyes. You know, financial planners will tell, you know, tell you and write books about how much you should be saving for your child's college from the day they're born. But the truth is, most families can't do that or struggle to do that. So especially first generation families who have never been to college themselves. So there's an element of um, uh, just ignorance. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, just yeah, I'm ignorant about lots of things. They just don't know how this math adds up and as higher education institutions, we haven't made it easy um, with, you know, well, here's our price, but then we're getting, you're getting aid, but then you're getting government aid and um, nobody pays a sticker price, but what you're paying isn't what they're paying. And mm -hmm. that way there's these fees, but you pay some of the fees, but not like, hello, can I get some clarity around what I'm going to have to pay? And so uh, we've done a bad job as a industry in communicating price and value. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at Bethany, we're certainly working hard to make it much clearer for prospective families. The truth is, um, given the fact that we're so generous in our financial aid, in most cases, a student can attend Bethany College for cheaper than attending most, most publics. I have a son that's a freshman at Ohio State. I'm writing a check uh, for, you know, six, seven thousand dollars more than it would cost, you know, if he ended up at Bethany. He's just yeah. not at Bethany. We don't have an engineering program and he wants to be an engineer. So um, because I'm sure that's gonna be on one of your lists. Of mine. Why isn't he at Bethany? <laughs> I wasn't gonna ask it, but somebody He's might be engineering, but yeah, that's the truth. Uh, the, we've not done a good job uh, marketing it. So, you know, in talking with families about um, affordability, there, there's a ministerial aspect to that. You're talking about some of the most um, sensitive topics in that family's life, and, and you have to know how to enter into that conversation. But, um, you know, we've largely taken, I, I don't want to paint with a, a wide brush here, but you know, because we're so generous with aid, you know, if, if somebody gives us a chance, we usually beat at everybody else's package. Now that's a good and bad thing, right? You know, we we don't want to over aid people because, you know, those resources are really important for us, you know, doing the things we're doing and providing the type of experience students deserve. So, um, so I wish it was a more simplified process, but we're working harder to simplify it for sure. We this past year we've collapsed a number of our fees, et cetera, so that it's you know kind of you know consumer clarity, so the prospective families can very easily understand what they'll um, their obligation will be when attending Bethany. Um, so when you talked about the strategic partnerships, and and again I I'm, I'm going to paint with a broad, broad brush of what a lot of those are for a lot of colleges when you talk about a strategic partnership with a with a corporation specifically it it was for a while there well we'll give you an internship or we'll give the college a, a, a an internship program what is the difference in the planning with these new partners or if you're not that far along maybe we don't talk about that but what what is the new thing that's going to be a part of this partnership with the organizations that you're um putting together yeah, you know, internships are really important. Uh, we need, uh, every Bethanian should have an experiential educational experience. And whether it's you're studying to be a teacher, of course, that's within the classroom. But um, regardless of your major, you should be having experiential education. So yeah, I certainly don't mean to belittle the importance of internships and fellowships, things like that. But what I mean uh, by way of strategic partnerships that's different than just an internship is that um, it's the college being responsive to the needs of the community and that specific partner. So for each partner, whether it's a corporate entity or, or nonprofit or whoever it might be, mm -hmm. you have to first understand what their needs are. Because once you understand their needs, you can respond to their needs. And once they believe and trust that you are the solution to their problem, they will invest in you being the solution to that problem. And, and that's important because we need some of those partners to help us underwrite uh, different things. Very few organizations today can go it alone. Um, you know, I don't care what industry you work in. There's an expectation that you're creating efficiencies through partnerships with others. Mm -hmm. And donors want to see that. Prospective donors want to see that you're in partnership with others. 
So I want to see corporations that are working with our faculty to help develop new academic programs, to help create new certificate programs, to help underwrite the costs of those programs, uh, to help underwrite um, scholarships for students, whether it's their employees or just new students that come to Bethany, to mm -hmm. participate in those programs so that they are the pipeline for the workforce that that strategic partner needs. So it's a much more integrated, sophisticated approach but frankly, um, both sides have more skin in the game. Uh, the college just can't go hat in hand to, to external partners, but you know, vice versa, they need to have skin in the game too in order for us to serve their needs. So that's what gets those partners to do just that. So that's what I mean by that. And then, so on the Bethany Trail, um, what is the brand? What is Bethany today? I've had... As I said, I had a hundred plus Beth Bethanians come through Dingo Talk. Uh, it was part of the alumni tour. They told us what they thought their Bethany was, why Bethany was special to them. Um, but for somebody that's never been there, they've never seen the sun coming up over Old Main, right through the right through the main entrance there. What is the brand of Bethany? Yeah, let me say this and. You know, I say this frequently because I truly believe it. And it's that um, Bethany, you know, by attending Bethany College and becoming a Bethanian, you're not just going to learn how to make a living. You're going to learn how to live life. And, um, you know, we're an institution and we're people that um, really help form and transform each dimension of, of, of the human being. So mind, body, spirit, emotions, et cetera. So, um, you know, how we brand that, how we market that, how we speak to that with various constituencies. We use different words at times, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and by doing all that, yes, we're still going to prepare you really well for a profession and uh, you're going to be competitive for any job in your discipline when you get out on the street. That's what the Bethany brand needs to be. And, um, and that's what we're working hard to do. When in this past year, this will be the last one. Uh, the second to last one. Sorry, I have one more, but it's a generic question. Um, in this last year, would you say that more alumni have come back to the table and want to have a skin in the game, want to have um, kind of have their fingerprints on this revitalization of Bethany? Is that accurate? I know Dino's doing an amazing job down at the Alumni Center. Um, I talk to him more than I talk to my own dad sometimes. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I guess it's good that it's your last or second to last. I've noticed I'm traveling right now and I, I notice I'm on 6%. I don't have my power cord with me. So if for some reason we get cut off, it looks like we'll do a part two at some point. But re rephrase your question. I'm sorry. You, you're um, so, uh, the alumni engagement. So yeah. alumni engagement, yeah, it's off the charts right now and it's, it's continuing to grow every day. And we saw that on uh, Tuesday, day, or Tuesday day of giving after Thanksgiving. You know, we... Um, the number of alumni that donated to the college was a 600% increase over last year. Wow. So think about that. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. I think people are excited by the strategic plan. We're excited by some of the results we're having. Uh, they were excited by the themes we chose. We chose Greek life and the theater that evening. So I think you know, we've tried hard to listen to alumni uh, in case you don't know this, uh, you all aren't shy. And so you're more than happy to share with me your perspectives on things. And we're listening. And so Wait, you don't say there's some bison out there that are that are not shy. <laughs> I, I would I would not imagine that to be um I've never had a conversation with an alumni that was that was not shy. You have to really bring them out of their shell. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you know, we've been doing a lot of listening this year, and I think you know, we're trying to respond appropriately to, mm -hmm. to some of what heard. Are we getting everything right? Absolutely not. Can we improve better every day? Of course we can. But we're going to put one foot in front of the other. Uh, we're going to call balls and strikes. When we screw up, we're going to call it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to celebrate our victories when we have them. And then the last question, uh, I've asked everybody in our, in our new season here, um, was there a question that you expected me to ask? And if so, how would you have answered it? <laughs> um. Actually, that's a tough one. I can't say there's necessarily a question I expected you to ask, um, but I'm sure my answer would have been yes to whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that was a little 
a little politician in that answer there. I, I'm sure I would have said yes. Yeah, of course <laughs> we'll do that for you, Carlos. So, look, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how grateful I am to you before we get off as, as an alum, uh, as somebody that's, um, you know, you represent, right, in, in the communications and the platform you're doing. It's been one of our most prestigious uh, majors we've had. And uh, you're a great role model for our current students. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for being a, um, a mouthpiece and a ambassador of Bethany College. We need it and uh, we're grateful for it. And um, you yeah, know that I'm happy to come back. And well, as Dr. Caridi said, he was running low on a thank you for that the, the kind words. Um, we are going to send it to our editor for editor's choice. Uh, this has been Dingo Talk with Dr. Jamie Caridi, the interim president of Bethany College. I am Carla Guadagnino, and Serenity Brown is going to now take it away. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. That's Serenity Brown. This is the editorial with Serenity Brown. As you heard there, I'm just going to address it right off the bat. You didn't say it. <laughs> this was shot... Many moons. Many moons ago, this was shot. We uh, we shot this before we really got into the coaches and, and the path that we've gone on this season. I thought it was important to get the episode out. Um, I think there's a lot of good things that are said. But before we get into her thoughts on it, because there are a lot of them, I'm sure, with both of us <laughs> being Bethany alumni. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Continue to watch. Hit the like button. Subscribe. Maybe leave us a comment. Tell us what we're doing wrong, how we can be better. There are many ways. Um, for those of you listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else that you listen to podcasts, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate it. Please share the episode. Listen to it. Like it. Subscribe. Don't miss an episode. Follow us on all the social medias. It's Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and Facebook. The only one different is the Instagram page. That is uh, dingo underscore talk. Unlike what I said in a previous episode, which was dingo talk underscore dingo score, whatever it was. Um, let's go. What did you think? All right. Well, first off, I want to start off by saying congratulations to this year's Bethany graduates because they just um, completed their graduation this past Saturday. So mm -hmm. congratulations to you guys. Um, Shout out to Emma and Caitlin. Um, I think those are the only two I know that. <laughs> actually so. um something about his voice was very lulling and i don't i don't want that to come off as like um tell it to boom but i don't want that to come off as me like saying like oh, he's boring it was just the way um like his tone and fluctuation it was just very like mm -hmm. calming, calming in a yeah. way yeah, yeah. um there's some very interesting, as obviously we're both Bethany alumni, some interesting like um, points and stuff that he had to say to improve the college. I I think that they're, they're, Bethany is being presented with an opportunity that most small liberal arts colleges currently in America are not getting the opportunity, and that's an alumni base that's now re-engaged um, seems to be v very vocal and and the positive side from the administration um, is that they seem to be trying to take these things into account yeah. now we all understand that there's there's financial things that go into this yeah not everything can be it, done. it, it can't it can't it's not it's not that it can't be done it, it it's not going to happen overnight. right away yeah um you know so if you're so inclined, if you're a Bethany alumni, make sure that if that's where you want to make you want to make a donation and you want to do that for Bethany College, that's that's what you should do. But make sure you talk to you know Dino and Millie at the uh, uh, at the alumni center um, and, and the other people that you can get if you if you have contacts on campus. Um, but make sure you donate to whatever you want to donate to. Make, uh, you know if you're going campus wide. If you feel strongly about a uh, a it doesn't have to be a sport. It could be the theater. The theater is something yeah. that I would hate to see go away from Bethany College. I mean, it, it's. I mean, yeah, it was. 
active in the theater and stuff like that. It's and and obviously you know and and for those of you that were here for the first I, what I don't know a hundred episodes, uh, Bethany is is very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I lived in the town. I went mouthpiece and ambassador. I knew it was going to come at some point. Um, it's just, it's an important place. And, um, I, I, I agree with the, the strongest point that I agreed with him on was, um, everybody that we had on before that they tell their stories and it's, you know, we all created our Bethany. Mm hmm um some of us had bubba's some of us had the bubba's 2.0 the bison in with chuck and not you know after bubba died uh most of the the people that are there now they don't know what bubba's was yeah. bubba's was a place that i opened up the dance floor downstairs for them what for your, formals for, and yeah and i mean it was a mixers, it, so stuff like that. but it goes both ways you know mm -hmm. the college got to has to obviously do a little bit more to help keep people with Bethany. Yeah. Which I think they're heading in the right direction with some things and we're gonna have some other people from Bethany. But at the same time the students the, have the to students understand have to understand that if you sit in your room all it's day gonna suck. And don't make things for you and your friends to do, of course you're gonna have a miserable time. You know, go to Chambers, go to Castleman, go out to the old cemetery, not the not the town cemetery, but the you know, God's Acre where Campbell and his entire family and, and, and the people that are important to Bethany College and the town of Bethany are buried. Um, go out. I wish I saw more people hanging out in the lawn of Richardson. Go out to Castleman. Go go find Frogtown, for those of you that know what that is. Go, How many people do? Go explore. There, there, there's a lot of things that you can do. That's, the that's I think, the most... Uh, now, adult way for me. Question? Sure. What were your thoughts during this episode? Because your um, face through the whole thing was an amusement of mine. I look at Bethany as something that could be great, and I think the more I talked to Doctor Caridi, the more I understood where the mentality of the board of trustees his are and where his vision going. and I, my judgment's out i'm not i didn't make a judgment off of the conversation sorry boomer um i it I, we've talked to a lot of coaches a lot some of these coaches have built programs some of these coaches have come into programs but the constant thing is is i can't make a judgment off of a 10 and 0 season after the 10 and 0 season, I want to see what happens five years, six years, 10 years down the road. My hope is that Bethany College is, and it seems to be heading in the direction that it will be here in 10 years. Um, I can say from living in the town that that has been a large question for many years. Uh, I can say as a student that that was a question. And that's not a shot at, at the previous, either previous administration. I, I was more in the two back than I was. It's just hard with it being such a small town. And where it not is. not much there. The location of it. It's just, it's hard. And I think, again, with the alumni but involvement. The potential. And people seem to be re-engaged. Um, and from the athletic standpoint, I mean, having Frankie there is great that's an alumni that people recognize they can associate with and not only can they associate with frankie the person they can associate the fact that he's been there for th four years now and they've gone to the championship for th two of those they years it. they've won it once they've lost they lost the other um what brian's doing at, at, as the ad um we're gonna have him on later on this summer I'm excited to get him back on the show as no longer a coach. He's a an administrator. He stepped away from coaching. I did not know that. Um, so I'm, I'm you know, I, I look at things from a sports mentality, but I also look at Bethany as there's so much more. I mean, there's 
Yeah. They, Greek Hill needs, obviously needs attention. We all know that anybody that's, anybody that's an alumni that's been back to campus, it, it needs attention. The houses need help. Um, you know, I know there are certain houses on the Hill there, alumni are very involved in there, and those houses are, are nicer. And like but having, it's, uh, having some like communication with some of the, um, at least my sisters from mm -hmm. Alpha Z, um, they've taken a step towards making them better. Um, but I still think we have a, a lot of leaps to go. Well, and, and that's not the only part of campus. Again, I no. point out the, yeah. the theater, the fact that um, I don't think the theater was utilized enough when I was a student. Uh, that was just my opinion. Um, not somebody that was involved in theater <laughs> did attend most of the the former head of that department's uh performances very left very confused almost every time but i think <laughs> I most people that. did yeah, I, I think they i think most of the actors were confused um <laughs> sometimes it's just nice to it's nice that we've stepped away from bethany we're not there i'm not there anymore i don't really seeing it from an outside perspective and, and that's how i'm looking at it um and i wish them the best of luck i hope yeah. that it continues to be successful i know they're adding programs they're adding athletic programs they're adding academic programs um so all of that it, it seems to be heading in the right direction um but again we're not there so it's not yeah. my judgment and i if i could afford to donate i would that's why we created the show was no. So we could get some some exposure to the college, and then you know now it's expanded just to expanded other grown. other places. So welcome back, Bethany family. It's good to see you. Um, stop back again. We're still here. Um, <laughs> that being said, don't forget if you need help, get help. If you need to just take a day or a couple days for your mental health, do that. The job will wait. It's not a big deal. The class will wait. You can talk to people. You need to talk to people. Um, and I mean, obviously, May being mental health awareness, but it, it shouldn't just be about this month. I, I, I know I'm now the second week in a row, and it's going to be the second week of May, and I'm the only time I've ever talked about this. But it's uh, it's very important for, uh, if you need help, get help. And if you just need to talk to somebody, uh, the Dingo Talk DMs are open. I'm sure somebody will... I'm a good listener. I don't. I don't know how good my advice is. I'm kind of an asshole sometimes, but like, sometimes. I can help you if you need it. Like, uh, and that's that's just that. So, uh, take care of yourself. Take care of your people. Got anything? Nope. See you. See you next week, chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.